guys. Uh, how many people are new here today? Okay, great. So, how did you hear about it? Uh, a young lady who was renting um, a wall of the main house was up watching a movie. It was a beautiful night last night. And she said, I want to remind you about Mia. I said, yeah, I know Mia from Florida. And she said, oh, by the way, there's a meeting at the library about the clock. Don't miss it. So, the timing was perfect. Good. Excellent. Um, my wife told me, but I'm pretty familiar with the spiral on that, and I just want to, I need more internet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can talk to him afterwards. He needs more internet. That's an about a guy thing for sure. My internet, Hughes net. I need more internet. Uh, okay, and uh, who else? I was invited by that guy. Great. Awesome. Okay. Uh, you know, other new people. We have a Kimberly that I've never got a chance to meet. Kimberly, say you. who you are. First time here as well. A patient told me about it, and she has her own business, and so I'm trying to learn to expand um, the practice that I work at. So here I am. Good. And Katrina, tell us about yourself. Um, well, I was a past student of Corian's, and I have been telling people about uh, the meetup that they have up here in Nevada County, and finally I just said, you know what, I'm just going to set the example going. Mm -hmm. Right on. Welcome. Well, okay. well, welcome. We are the largest business meetup in Nevada County. We are over 400 members strong. Uh, we also video our meetings, so we've got the video of this will be available uh, through our website, and also NCTV is really happy to work with us and, and shows a variety of Nevada County online meetups. We are a community that's working to get better at marketing and internet marketing. And we have members of the group who are service providers, people that do graphics or writing or website design. We've also got a lot of small businesses. So we've got uh, hotel owners and we've got authors and a variety of other kind of business models. We're here because internet marketing changes a lot and it's challenging to keep up on all of the things that are there and to see what actually can work. So we bring in a speaker every month to talk about a variety of marketing topics from search engine optimization to website design, email marketing, social media, to more. Uh -huh. Script writing, copywriting, copy. You've been to all these speakers. You got one more, one more. One more, marketing. <laughs> marketing plans. How's marketing that? plans, there you go. Um, so I'm Corey, I'm, this is Machen. We're the facilitators of the group. We're a community driven group, so there's options for you to join the leadership team. Uh, if you have anything that you would like to contribute, please talk to us after the meeting. Want to do wins? Yeah, usually uh, at this stage of the game, what we'd like to do is reach out to the audience, and if there's a win that you've had with your business online, then you can share that, because this is part of we learn through others, not just whoever we have up and, and presenting. So if there's something you've accomplished, whether it might be uh, on LinkedIn or Facebook or your own website or you know new neat tool that you're using. I'm currently using these landing pages by uh, leads pages, which is, is pretty cool. Um, so if so you have something our obstacles, things that you would like to get an opinion on. So anybody doing anything related to their business with online marketing that's working for them? Yeah. yeah. Um, I helped optimize a website that actually made a big difference. The old website um, was extremely hard to navigate. It, it was hard to find specific products. Yeah, it's an e-commerce website, of course. I've, I've worked with Corian mm -hmm. with this company before. And um, in rebuilding the website using uh, Avada, which is a pretty popular uh, business template, uh, we were able to, to make the website um, not only look much nicer, but much easier to navigate and increase sales immediately. That's awesome. So no more being oil? No more being oil. Thank goodness. Gee, many crickets. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible program. <laughs> <laughs> I helped them and say, get rid of this platform. They're like, no, we're married to it. And I was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other? Yeah, any other? Actually, I'm new students for a long time. I also take Merchant's uh, class. So I'm happy to report for Stonehouse as an event venue, we have 4,400 like. Wow. So that's something really beyond my expectation. And now on LinkedIn, even I didn't really cultivate a lot, I focus on Facebook, but a lot of people recommended Nico Wu as like marketing, social media. 
So I might be even hired by other people to do marketing. So now I have a right. production company asking me to do marketing for them. That's cool. Really? Uh -huh. I barely speak English. <laughs> <laughs> you speak Facebook quite well. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's do one more. What else we got? Love to hear about the lead pages. What are those? Um, yeah, so there's a, a tool. I, I was actually out in Phoenix. Uh, there's a company called Infusionsoft, and uh, they have an annual convention. And when I was out there, there was this company that had something called Leads Pages. And basically, they're like little mini landing pages, templates that you can build instantly and capture email addresses and names and whatever else you want to capture. So rather than having to recreate a whole page for your website, you can just use these templates and make it look and feel like your own website, but get them up and running in like five or ten minutes. And then there's a lot of cool code that they give you so you can plop it into Facebook ads or any other social media platform that you want. So just, if I can do it, anybody can do it. It just makes it really easy to... You get an idea, you have a product, you want to promote that product, you can just sweep it into this leads page, this landing page, and get it out there. The yep. yeah. thing I like about lead pages, you guys haven't used them, is they test the page designs over and over and over and over again. So you're essentially getting this format that you can plug into that's already been tested for color, font, all these other details that you a lot of times have to guess around, yeah. whereas they've done a lot of that work too. Lead Pages has a nice WordPress plugin too, so that you can actually have it come to your website. Mm -hmm. So you're you're getting the SEO and the traffic coming right to your website too. Great. Yeah. Do those uh, lead pages work with other programs like uh, Dream, Dreamweaver, other than WordPress and so forth? You just you need to take take that. I'm not an expert, and I just learned something from Evelyn. So I, I'm just like all <laughs> from oh, Yes, they do. They do. Yeah, because you just essentially take that same landing page, but you put it as a put an independent right. page on your right. customized right. website. Yes. Okay. Uh, let's see. Spread the word about Nevada County Online. There are cards at the back table there. You can talk to Laura for more. Uh, but grab some of these. I like to keep these in my wallet so that if I am talking to somebody about business, I can just say, hey, there's this really cool group that you can learn a lot about marketing and online marketing. Uh, I, I should also mention, coming up in the next few months, we've got some good speakers. One particularly that I'm excited about is a young gentleman named uh, Basil McMahon. I met him at the farmer's market and struck up a conversation relationship. Turns out he's a very successful clothing company that's kind of eco clothing line, and he is very effective at using Facebook advertising. And so we're going to do a case study with him coming up soon, where I'll work with him to create a presentation around exactly what he is doing to have a successful business in a very competitive market. Okay, let's get started. So, let me introduce our wonderful speaker today. This topic is a little bit off what we usually do, because we're usually focused on marketing. But if you don't know about what's in the works for Nevada County, you are at the right place to learn some really exciting things about the upcoming Gigabit Network. This is being done through Spiral Internet. Our speaker today, John Paul, is the CEO of Spiral. He's known for, among other things, working to get Google Fiber here. He has a 95959 Google project that came within a hair's breadth of, of losing out to Kansas City, correct? Yeah. Yeah. A little bigger. But this is cool because that entire process has culminated in John working and working and working with his team over the last five, seven years, about that, uh, to get funding, grant funding, to get to the door internet speed. Can anybody tell me how fast is a gigabit speed? A thousand megabits. A thousand megabits. So what does that mean? Can I watch YouTube videos faster? Like how fast? Like 20 YouTube videos. <laughs> you can have them on 20 different computers in your house. While downloading like a 40 gig file, do everything. Yeah. Be faster than San Francisco. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, it's it's 100 times the speed of DSL. 100 times to your door for probably going to be under 100 bucks a month, right? Okay. Why? So he's going to talk about this. <laughs> so I'm not going to steal any more of John's thunder other than to say. 
This is amazing. I was part of a visioning process that John invited me to with other community leaders where we set out to say, well, how is this going to change our community? And it's tremendous. So anybody here who is, for example, a video editor, that you have to be connected, like you can't live in Chicago Park and go and upload and download huge gigabit files. But guess what? You will be able to soon. Or whether you're the hospital and you want to make sure that everybody's medical records are available all the time so that you can actually go and interact with very big resolution, MRIs and everything else. This is going to change our community and your businesses. So, yeah. Just, I want to just, just tag along that because I'm a real estate agent and I have people who come up from the Bay Area and their number one criteria is internet. Yep. And if it doesn't work, they don't move here. Yeah. It's like that simple. And so we have a need. I'm, I'm so excited to hear this because I okay. am constantly I'm hearing uh, issues of... Everybody's excited. Things. Let's get you up here. John <laughs> Paul, CEO of Sorry. He's here to hear the Okay, so here's what's interesting. Um, you know, this is Nevada County Online, and in the areas that we're building our gigabit network first, we're not going to do online marketing because these people don't have internet access. So we have to think about that. How do we get information to people who are actually going to send out EDPs, which is kind of funny. So, um, so I, have, uh, I have the luxury of talking for a long time today. I've been doing 20 minutes, 10 minute presentations about this. So I'm going to really give you the history of Spiral, how we came to this point. I'm going to talk about what a gigabit is and talk about why other internet doesn't work the way it works. I'm going to talk about some future partnerships that we're going to have uh, with uh, Kansas City and Austin, which is kind of exciting because of the connections we've made over the past five years. And um, and how Nevada County is really going to be on the map. I mean, things are going to be happening here. And people from the Bay Area are going to want to move here because there is not gigabit service in the Bay Area anywhere. And Google will be doing it at some point, but we're going to be there before they are, which is kind of cool. So. In May of 2006, uh, we launched Spiral Internet. We were entrusted with the customers of Nevada County Community Network, or NCCN, which had been around for 10 years at that point. It was a nonprofit ISP internet service provider that started, and the whole intent was to provide community-based internet access, and they were allowed to do that because in 1996, the Federal Telecommunications Act of that year allowed third-party providers to offer DSL on the AT&T lines, or the Bell lines at that point. Uh, and so they didn't like it, but it allowed for more competition, and so NCCN was formed. They weren't doing very well 10 years later. They had a lot of bad um, contracts with AT&T, bad meeting. AT&T was charging them too much for services, and AT&T was rolling its prices down, but NCCN couldn't, and, and AT&T wouldn't renegotiate, so they needed to let go. And they came to myself and my business partner at that time, Chip Carmen, and we said, okay, let's do this, and we started a Spiral Internet. So. I'm going to start off with a video because it's, uh, yeah, you know, you guys running online video stuff. Uh, customer number one was uh, from NCCN. We did a short video about him and it tells you a little bit about who Spiral is and a little bit about internet access, kind of to what you're after. Dan, uh, you are literally customer number one in our database. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you got started out as uh, that, uh, the NCCN's uh, first customer once upon a okay. time? I had a business associate, a associate that was a friend, and we were talking about getting internet service because it was relatively new at that time in our area. This was in the mid 1990s. We were during the 90s, somewhere yeah. in there, and he told me about NCCN. He said, "Use that one. It's a." community supported network and I said fine and I didn't know how to sign up so I was out at the fair that year walking through the big display booth and there was the NC big NC NCCN sign and I walked over and started talking to him and I signed up at the fair that was the first day and I didn't know I was number one until I had called over a few times for tech support and the gal that answered the phone said I think of you every day, and I said, well, why is that? <laughs> when we boot up our computers, your name and everything comes up on the screen first. She said, you're number one in our database, and I'm, wow, that's kind of cool. Yeah. So I was always impressed about that, and then when 
spiral took over whenever I call and I get you on the phone for tech support, I tell you who I am and yep. I always tell you I'm numero uno. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, back in the day, that was uh, dial-up internet service yes. uh, took over your phone line. You would have to plug your computer in, and you couldn't place phone mm -hmm. calls. Uh, and then uh, it was a big deal when we switched over to DSL in the mid-2000s. Yeah, now. I like that a lot better, because you could try and download something on dial-up and go cook dinner while it was downloading. Yeah, it took so long. Yeah, so, <laughs> and uh, the difference in speeds between uh, dial-up and DSL is about a factor of a hundred, and we're going to be doing that again. Uh, so, the uh, we're really excited about that. Uh, and in fact, uh, you are in our first project area for that Good. fiber switch. Um, and uh, are, are you looking forward to uh, that availability? Yes, I'm, I've heard a little bit about it. I don't quite understand how it works, but if it's going to be even faster, I like that. Yeah, uh, well, uh, we'd like to uh, actually extend an offer to you of uh, one year of free fiber service. Whoa. If you, uh, uh, once we are able to start uh, getting it out to your house, uh, you know, as customer number one, we would love to, uh, you know, keep that continuity. I like that. I like that. <laughs> very good service over the years. I've really appreciated all the technical support and just the help when I had to bring in a computer or a iPhone over here to have you help me get it set up. Because I, back when it was dial up. I was pretty computer literate. Now, forget it. <laughs> it's a pretty big technology yes. change, but yes. we're looking forward to continuing to support you. Well, I appreciate your help and assistance. Thank you, Max. Thank you, Dan. So, uh, that's who Spiral is. Uh, customer number one is a great example of how we treat our customers and how we work with people, and uh, uh, it was great that he, he's still with us. It's kind of He's all excited about his fiber connection. So uh, after we took over uh, and started Spiral Internet, we decided we had to figure out what we are going to do. So we knew that selling dial-up, which we were at the time and still are, <laughs> as well as DSL wasn't going to be where the future was going to be, and we needed to find out. So um, how do we make it better here? So first we looked at a wireless middle-mile project, and spent a number of years we applied for two stimulus fund grants, very big grants through... Um, the American uh, Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Um, those, in the second uh, iteration of that, we got to do diligence. It was pretty incredibly uh, crazy uh, process where you're dealing with seven people from Bose, Allen, Hamilton, and Washington, D.C. throwing questions at you, hired by the federal government to make sure your application is clean. And uh, we made through most of it. Uh, there were some problems. We had uh, partnered at that point with the Economic Research Council. There were some problems with the application. We wound up not getting funded. And it took some time for us to recover from that uh, and figure out where we were going to go. And, but in the middle of all that, Google announced something. So in the middle of that second application, Google said one, on one morning, I believe in February, they said, 2010, they said, you know, we're going to bring gigabit service to one community. And I talked to Chip on the phone as soon as I saw it. And I walked across the street to Gene Malpahl's office. He was the city manager at that time. He was, uh, this room is named after him. He passed away a number of years ago. And uh, I said, Gene, can we do this on behalf of Nevada City? Because you needed one uh, community to uh, apply for. And he said, absolutely, go forward. And so we said, how many people here were at the 959 9, 9, 9, 9, Google event? So, so some people were here. Um, so we wanted to find out if there was some interest in this ultra-fast speed here, because we knew it was going to be a big endeavor to do it. And this was simultaneously doing the wireless thing, mind you. So we put together an incredible group of volunteers. Michael Anderson, who was here, uh, jumped in. Uh, we had about 10 other people who helped us pull this together. And we came up with a video from that event, which we posted on YouTube, because Google had asked for that. But the, Google, the, the video is very relevant because it was talking about gigabit fiber service and what was needed here. So if you, I'm going to show it to you now. It's only eight minutes. And it will give you an idea of what we really need here and why people need it. And if you place the word Google with spiral, you'll kind of get where we're headed. Such a long history of innovation. 
innovation and ingenuity that actually stems from the gold rush. Uh, inventions such as the long distance telephone uh, comes from this area in the 1800s. Today we're actually known as the Silicon Valley of the Sierras, uh, as well as a, a cultural and artistic haven. I've actually had the great privilege of traveling well over 50 countries around the world, and, and I was the first woman to uh, complete a solo winter trek of Alaska, so I've actually seen a lot. But I've never seen a place like this. Uh, our pioneering spirit, our ingenuity, is a perfect fit for the Google project. It's my honor today, on behalf of the city, to welcome you all to 95909 Google Rally. Foundation of Technology firms here, I think that's a real plus, that we're not starting from zero. We already have people who really know what to do with the gig of it. When you're watching news, sports, or entertainment programming, whether it be on your television, on the web, or even a mobile phone, you're watching Grass Valley Group's equipment at work. We started right here in Grass Valley over 50 years ago, and now have offices in 20 countries worldwide. We have been and continue to be on the forefront of video technology innovation. With access to an ultra-high-speed network, such as Google's fiber network, we can speed our innovation and bring dynamic new services and products to our customers all over the world. Caltrain is one of the local high-tech companies here that focus on video. Now, with high definition playing such a critical role in our industry today, the average style file size has grown tremendously, often exceeding 40 to 50 gigabits now. Daily, we ship these files many, many times between our development centers and our customers. So having ultra-high-speed connectivity would be a huge deal for our company. On the personal side, we're located in the beautiful Sierra Nevada foothills. To attract key towns in this region, we need fast connectivity for those employees in the residences. Today, it just doesn't exist. So we would welcome Google here with open arms. And one of the things that broadband does and fast access does is it unites us. No matter where you sit politically, no matter where you sit religiously, no matter what your beliefs are, you understand that the internet these days is crucial to be in the world, to be a part of the world, and to be connected to your community. The well-connected community is a civically engaged community, and we currently live stream our city and council meetings. However, many people who want to tune in are unable to at this time. We really need to take it to the next level and fully engage and let our citizens interact with their local governments, providing greater transparency, accountability, and civic part participation. Rural America needs broadband access, and we are the place who will help you deploy it, help you test it, and make it work. Technology plays a large part in education today across all grade and age levels and curricular areas. And students who have access to internet connections and um, higher connectivity and greater speed can greatly benefit from that. In Nevada County, we have a large number of kids who don't have that access, and so they're at an extreme disadvantage. We're really excited that this project might bring access to those students, and who knows where they're going to go with that. My company, based in Video Valley, is creating the next generation of content delivery platform which is designed for media processing, real-time image analysis, and metadata streaming over broadband. The availability of bandwidth is critical because the larger the neural pathways between computationally dense nodes, the richer the technical possibilities for exploration. We Google in the morning. We Google in the evening. All over this land. I'm the VP of Impulse Devices, and we do fundamental physics research and collaborate with a group of universities around the country. The Google Ultra High Speed Internet would help us collaborate and work together with our partners in a more effective way. So I'm doing my fourth startup. It's a cloud-based web mining. And what I've learned from the past startups is that success and failure is more about having the right talented people versus technology. If we had an older high speed internet network here in Nevada County, it would make it much, much easier to attract the talented people you need to be successful.
I live in Nevada County and work at a major television news station in Sacramento, 60 miles away. Being live is key to covering the community. With an ultra high speed internet connection, we can eliminate grain up stack trucks or microwave trucks. I envision hooking up my camera to the laptop, diving into the station's servers, and bingo, we're live from Nevada County, made possible by Google. us because we have so much great stuff to share with the rest of the world. And we'd be the perfect place to, to do testing because we have everything a large city has in a rural area. Things you need to live in highest quality right here. Google this will only help that. Because we're a great community, community and we help each other, and I think that's wonderful. Community Radio, KBMR FM, here at the Went to the Sacramento Bee. Uh, all of a sudden, we were in the Sunday New York Times, along with all. I mean, we clearly were on the coattails of what Google was doing. So I, there we were. Talked about the Nevada City and the parade we did. And then our video was shown. Actually, a pretty big clip of it on Katie Quirk's uh, nightly news show on CBS. It was like, whoa, this can really happen. So we had Nevada City, you know, on the map uh, and nationally because of the event, which was kind of cool. I still good about that. So why do we need a gig? Because when, we, when Google announced that in 2010, all the other providers said, what are you going to get for? Who could possibly use a gig? It's way too much. And um, that wasn't the point, of course. I'm going to tell you why. So in order to find out why we need a gig, you need to understand how the internet works. So I happen to have a, a primer here about internet access. I'm going to teach you a little bit about why your internet connection sucks. <laughs> so, first of all, we had, uh, we had DSL, it's vanishing here. Uh, that's kind of the top speed you can get, you get a little faster with this product uh, called um, uh, Uverse, uh, which is basically fake Uverse here because they don't have television. A little faster if you're like 500 feet from the central office. <laughs> but that's, that's really the fastest you can get. 
And what's happening is, and realtors know this, is someone buys a house, uh, someone's living there, they have DSL access with AT&T, the house sells, a new person comes in, calls AT&T, and AT&T says, sorry, we're no longer offering service at that location. This is horrible for our realtors up here, but it's happening more and more, especially in the areas where there's no cable service, which is the preponderance of Western Nevada County. So, second, satellite came along, and that was kind of cool because you kind of had a little more access to, as long as you saw the satellite, and some people can't because they're on the wrong side of the hill, but most people can. Uh, the speeds were great, you know, I mean, compared to what we had, but we were dealing with a couple issues. One was, with that satellite being 20,000 miles up in the air and coming back down again, you start to perceive that your internet connection is slow because there's a latency there, so that little bit of milliseconds that it takes to go up and down and back up and down creates a pause and it feels like things are going slow. The other thing that the satellite companies did, and uh, I don't know why they did this because it's hardly good customer service, is that if you use too much data in a short period of time, they will throttle down your speed for the rest of the month. And you had to wait till the next month. I mean, what year is it? You have to wait till the next month to get better internet service. That's not going to work anymore. And so they're suffering from that. So even though they announce these great speeds, uh, it's really not a great way to get internet. Uh, fixed wireless came along, so we have a number of providers that actually broadcast wirelessly from a terrestrial point of view. So they're on, um, sometimes they're up in trees, sometimes they're on towers, uh, smarter broadband, uh, digital path, Coltax.net are three of them. Uh, another one, um, uh, uh, XWire. XWire, sorry, I should put XWire up there. Uh, and they provide service in the area. Uh, the problem with that here is the speeds are, can be fairly fast. Uh, they're faster than this now. There's some, some speeds coming on a little faster than this. But you need to have line of sight from where they're broadcasting. And if you go anywhere except down in kind of the north uh, west side of Penn Valley, um, you're going to have real problems with getting internet, uh, being able to see the towers there. And so the coverage is really spotty. So it's good if you can get it. Most people can't get it. The preponderance of people can't. So it's a great idea, and those providers are providing a valuable service where there's no other internet access. Cellular does the same thing. They're broadcasting off the towers. They have a little better penetration because of the frequency they're on. Um, again, the speeds are fairly decent. However, the issue with... Um, uh, Cellular services, they charge you by the gigabyte, not the gigabit. There's a difference, and I'll tell you about that, why that difference is later. But they charge you by how much you use. So um, uh, Joshua, uh, who runs the Curly Wolf, happened to, I'm going to tell his story, he happened to uh, move to a place where there's no internet access. So you can get these little buckets from Verizon that you put on your roof, and you can have internet access there, same way you would from a fixed wireless provider. And the family, the four of them, started using the internet like they normally were using when they were on Comcast. And that first month they got their bill was $600. Well, that's not going to work, you know, using, you know, and that's just regular usage on the internet. So it's not a great idea. The cell companies will tell you, hey, we have rural America covered, we're going to give them cellular data. But what they're not saying to the FCC is that we're charging you an arm and a leg for that, which is really unacceptable. Uh, cable is our best bet. But uh, a couple issues here. It's a very small area. Uh, we both have Comcast and Suddenlink. Suddenlink since uh, South County. Comcast tends to be centered around Grass Valley, Nevada City, and also in the gated communities like Wildwood, uh, Lake of Pines. And um, they uh, offer great service. It's the best internet service here that you can get right now. If you can get it, definitely get it. People call us and go, well, we want to you know, support a local provider. And I go, can you get Comcast? And they go, yes. And I go, really, do just go do that, you'll be much happier. So we support Comcast in that way. Um, and suddenly to a lesser extent. However, the way the, those cable networks are set up is that the bandwidth comes into the community and then it's shared by everyone. If you're on, if you're on cable, you'll notice that at night, things get a little slower. You're not getting that 50 megabits per second. In fact, you're probably not getting anywhere near it. And it starts to become more and more like DSL because way too many people are using way too many devices because they have a faster speed and it's just not working. So all of a sudden you're seeing why a gigabit might be a little bit better. So here's a little map here. So dial-up is about the size of a golf ball. DSL is wireless about the size of a basketball. Uh, cable, 50 megabits per second is about a yoga ball. And then one gigabit per second is a 9 foot diameter beach ball like the one we had at the 959 Google Pad. So you can see the relative size of things going on. So things, a lot more data can go through that bigger pipeline. 
So that's the download speed or downstream speed. I'm going to come up back a little later with the upstream speed, which you're going to be shocked to find out is not exactly the same. So the existing services are asymmetrical. The down speed is not equally up speed. And we don't know that because the only speeds we typically see in advertising are that downloads. Six megabits per second, 10 megabits per second. However, when you start getting the upload speeds, dial-up stays the same, dial-up symmetrical. Um, <laughs> what, uh, DSL and fixed wireless, all of a sudden, they're one going up. So if you ever try to upload a file or upload a video, you'll notice it takes a lot longer than watching it come down. Cable is sometimes six, can be 10 if you have 100 megabits per second. Again, it's a lot slower going up and you're still dealing with that. And then gigabit symmetrical, because of the nature of fiber optic cable and the way it works, Symmetrical speeds can be had, so the upload speed and the download speed are the same. And this is really critical. For a long time, I had a DSL line dedicated to my desk, because uh, we were just bringing Comcast in for some server functions we had. And I noticed every time I go to uh, work on QuickBooks online, I would hit the return key and there would be a little pause. Well, imagine working on your computer and having that same pause all the time. It was driving me nuts because our computers are set up like little gigabit networks. They're not quite that fast. I think they're 100 megabits per second now. But they're fast enough internally to really speak to the software and hardware. And when you kick, uh, click a button, it actually responds. Once you're on the internet, all bets are off because you don't have those speeds. So QuickBooks Online, I hit return and I wait. That's nuts if you're entering a lot of data. But a lot more applications are moving online into the cloud rather than residing on your computer, and you're going to need that quick response in order to do anything of any uh, uh, worth you know, without driving yourself crazy. And this is the situation we're in. So, in 2010 to 2012, we said, okay, if we're going to build this fiber network. We know Google thinks they can do it, but we found out out the door that Google had no clue what they were doing. We actually met with some of the Google people early on who were a part of that uh, Google Fiber initiative, and they were like, we're just trying to figure this out. We have no idea what we're going to do. It's really funny to hear that. And they picked Kansas City, ultimately, because Kansas City gave them a real sweetheart deal. They said, we own the polls here. You can be on those for no charge. We're going to give you really quick permitting. We're going to make it happen really fast. And that's why Google went to Kansas City first. And there's a great story. Uh, Michael and I, Michael Anderson and I, uh, who's Spiral CIO, who's becoming Spiral CIO, um, we're in Kansas City just in January. We got to sit down with uh, two key people from the, from the Kansas cities and hear about why Kansas City got it and how Kansas City, Missouri, and Kansas City, Kansas actually didn't know that each of those cities had uh, submitted an application separately and then now they're working together. Kansas City's a hopping place. Mike will probably talk a little bit about that. So we started going to conferences. So Chip and I started, we went to the California Bridge and Technology Fund first, and went fiber to the Home Council, which is coming is coming to California this year. I actually get to be a speaker at it. I was an observer the first time, and I'm a speaker. Broadband Community Summit was amazing, and then Google Fiber uh, had some events. Uh, not Google did, but Kansas City had some events based on the Google Fiber event. There. So we started to connect with people and figured out, you know, we could do this here. And we can make this happen in a really great way, because lots of small communities around the country are doing it. Very small cities were building gigabit networks because the local telephone company was a mom and pop telephone company. There's lots of those across the US. There's very few in California, but there's uh, centered in the Central Valley. And um, so we were, we were inspired by what was going on. So we figured out there was a solution, or there is a solution. And we thought, what if the internet just worked? What if, imagine having electricity that sometimes gave you full power and sometimes didn't give you full power. <laughs> or water, you know, water, I, I used to use water as that um, example, but my water pressure can go down a little bit sometimes. But it's still the same thing. What if you couldn't use water quite as effectively all the time? We would go nuts. And the internet needs to just work. It's become a utility as far as the network goes. So we started to have community meetings in 2011, 2012. We had um, 13 community meetings around the community. People came out just like this. We talked about what we were doing, what we were interested in doing. We put a survey out to see what the actual need was. People were all over this. We realized, wow, we could really build a great business here and provide a great opportunity for the community. So uh, we looked at fiber optic technology. There's two kinds, basically, a passive. I'm going to get a little geeky here on you. Passive optical network and active Ethernet network. We found out through the engineers we were working with that active Ethernet is a better way to go. It's more expensive, but it allows a lot of scalability in the future, and it allows people to have pure access to their homes. So we don't replicate what the cable companies have done in that 
the one pipeline comes into commuting, gets split up, and then all of a sudden your speeds are being shared by a bunch of people. So we're building an active Ethernet network. We also looked at poles versus underground, and we drove around here and we said, I don't think that's going to work. And we, and we called the Northern California Pole Association, because it exists. <laughs> and that's how the Polish American, you know. <laughs> uh, but we called it and they said, well, this is how it works. You become a member of the Pole Association, and sometimes PG&E owns a pole, sometimes AT&T. And then you pay a little bit per year to be on those poles. And if along your route, as you're attaching to those poles, you find out we determine that one of those poles is rotting, you replace it at your cost. And I was like, really? How will I ever know? I mean, I, I, have you driven around looking at the poles here? There's, like, there's a lot of rotting poles. And like, no, we're not going to do that here. So we decided to go fully underground. Well, that's going to be a benefit because by being fully underground, we're safe from fire, we're safe from a lot of things. And uh, in some cases, we may be able to partner with pg and &E where they want to go underground as well. That's what we're looking at as possibly to do. So that's what we decided to do technologically. So then we uh, decided, so where do we build it? What's the best place to do here? You know, we didn't even know where to begin. So again, through these conferences we went at, we found a firm uh, back east that came out and did an analysis of five areas in the county. We picked the five areas, we mapped it, they came out and did all the studies for us. And, uh, and uh, surprising to us, uh, it was a, uh, we came out with three different phases, and I'll talk about those in a second, and we realized that we could really do this here. They also did the uh, amazing, uh, uh, spreadsheet about you know the return on investment and and, and uh, what it would cost to build it and what it would cost you know to provide service. So it was really amazing. So in summer 2012, you may have noticed there's been a lot of construction here. People assumed it was us building our network. I wish it was, but uh, the orange cable that was being put in through the county was part of a middle mile project that did get federal funding. And they, it goes through all all of western Nevada County, kind of comes in at Highway 49 in Auburn and goes through Grass Valley through Nevada City right to this library. In fact, one of the connections is here once they turn it on. And then it heads down um, uh, through Penn Valley and then out into Yuba County. And uh, that's a middle mile project. We, we, we can have access to that. It's open. It's like the bigger pipeline that connects us to yet the bigger pipeline. And so it's a benefit that it's here. We always assume that this was why we could build it here. We find out there's some other opportunities now, but this is a good, uh, if it's not our primary access, it's a good redundant access. So that's, what's, that, that's what was happening here. They're not done quite yet. It's been a very large project, and they've had some obstacles here in the Bad County. So on February 1st of 2013, and the year before that, California announced that they were going to re-open uh, up some monies for the California Advanced Services Fund. If you look at your phone bill, there's a little, if you look at the final fees and regulations part, there's a little bit that says CASF, about 14 cents a month. Everybody in California puts that into that fund monthly, and then the resources are used for rural areas and areas where there's not good broadband uh, in, in the uh, state. So we went ahead and applied for a phase one grant application. We applied for $17.2 million. We're going to raise 11.5 uh, in private match. It's clearly been two years and a half since that happened. I'm going to go into a personal story now because in the middle of all that, Chip, Chip Carmen was my business partner. He also happened to have been my spouse. It was his idea to build this gigabit network. He, I mean, he when we didn't get the wireless one, I said, well, what do you want to do? He said, well, I really want to build a network. And I said, I really want to run a company. So it matched. And we went forward with this. But what happened in 2013, right after we uh, uh, submitted the grant application, is Chip uh, was diagnosed with cancer. He died six months later. And he diagnosed with me. He died on October 31st in 2013. Uh, my personal life was in complete upheaval of that year. And luckily, the grant application was taking longer because we could barely deal with that. I'm really sorry he's not with us to see this happen. But Chip was an inspiration to make this happen. Uh, I'm his gravestone. I don't talk about this publicly that much. I the promotion here. Uh, his, his gravestone is kind of cool. It's in Cooper and Weaver, and his vision was to build a gigabit fiber network and put that on there. And uh, so that's always there. It's in Nevada County. Uh, I think that's kind of cool. And the best part about it is we're naming it the Chip Carbon Brent Fiber Network. So it'll be named after him. And the cool part is every little cable will have that imprinted on it uh, throughout the construction. So I like that idea. So we are building a gigabit per second symmetrical service, and more. The thing about building an active Ethernet network is we're going to need a terabit at some point, and faster at some point. This network will handle that, and we know that, and that's why we're building it this way. 100% fiber optic, all the way from the back hall, all the way to your house, and if you want, sometimes in your house, because you can have fiber network in your house. Many people will do a, a wireless network or uh, 
have a, a Ethernet network in their house. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk to customers about that when we get there. So phase one is 26 square miles. Surprisingly to us, we're based in Nevada City. Phase one, the company we hired said, you want to build in South County because there's a problem here. The problem is that from Colfax, the telephone company is Verizon, and they come up through here. Verizon bought that uh, telephone company from a small mom and pop provider about 15 years ago and never deployed DSL. So that's the reason there's no DSL coming through here. Verizon territory for landlines, but no DSL. The AT&T DSL comes from the north down, and that starts to taper off, because the further you get away from things, you start getting that. <coughs> this is a really perfect area to build our network. There are some fixed wireless, a uh, number of fixed wireless providers there. Again, it's very spotty, because if you go there, there's tons of trees. Uh, you, know, you can put things in trees, but if, you, if they can't see the dish to dish, you can't bring the service. So we realized it was the perfect area to do this. So that's phase one. Um, in that area, there's 2,900 households and 340 businesses. We realized that the northern part of the area, which is Crown Point Circle, Whispering Pines, and by the airport, they only had DSL. There's no Comcast internet up there because when they were built, that project was built, internet was not needed and cable companies didn't go to business parks because they didn't want, think people wanted television at their places of work. And they were right, we didn't. So, uh, so there's no Comcast there. Comcast has no plans to go there in the near future. We're going to really make that area uh, work well. It's phase one of our phase one. We will build service there first. So phases two and three will add 11,000 households and 200 businesses. And this is a little bit of that map. As you can see, Nevada County here. Uh, the purple area is where Comcast is now. We will eventually go into that area, but not out the door because we're not going to compete with them head on because they will artificially lower their prices and kill us because mm -hmm. that's what they do. They're a very competitive company. And that internet service is okay for now, but eventually we will come in there. The uh, other areas are phase two surrounds Nevada City. Actually, we're going to bring gigabit service to the town of Washington going up Highway 20. They're really excited. <laughs> so it's going to be a cool place to live. <laughs> um, very shortly, and uh, the, the Public Utilities Commission can't wait for us to do that because it's a, it's a disadvantaged community. They love serving uh, funding areas that are disadvantaged in California. And then we're also going to go up to the ridge along Tyler Foot Road, uh, both sides of that. And then uh, third phase is uh, kind of the Penn Valley area, and then this part of South County, and, uh, and this part that goes up tucked kind of behind uh, Nevada City and Grass Valley and Banner Mountain area. World Comcast, again, is not. So we have three phases. Uh, once the uh, grant application looks like it's going to be approved within six weeks, I'm giving them final numbers now that they're asking for. We've already become a telephone utility, which is part of the process. So we're a telephone company now, which is the only utility you could become. So we're a telephone company. And hopefully, there'll be an internet utility status at some point in the future. But for right now, I guess we're spiral bell, right? Is that what they mean? So uh, that, and the reason we did that is that gives us access to rights of ways for construction, yeah, like any utility has in, in, the, uh, in the state. Um, we are the first rural community in Northern California with gigabit access. There, it, this is not happening in the Bay Area yet. It's going to really change what's going on here. People will be moving up here. I mean, it's going to be interesting to watch as we announce this and, and start to build it and see what happens. It's going to be an exciting place to live. And, um, yeah. And John, we have a question for you. Yeah, on the last map, what, what percent penetration? The color is solid. Does that mean you're going to access the whole yep. household? Yep. Wow. Yeah, so what we're going to do is we build the laterals. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about it. I, I have a next okay. slide about the construction and how it works. But yes, we are in those, in those areas where it's solid, we will solid, solidly build and access. It's all in the wire. And it's all underground. All underground. That's a lot of digging. A lot of digging. It's a big undertaking, and it's well worth it. So, uh, yes, I know everyone goes, you know, it's, it, it's fascinating to watch the naysayers through this whole process. Why are you going underground? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? And I'm doing it because 100 years from now, I want this thing to be working. And, you know, we can build something temporarily, and then we're, it's going to have to be swapped out in three years. Why do that? Why not build it right? And PUC is starting to get it, but, oh, yeah, your project's kind of cool. You're going to be around for a while. You're not going to come back for money. And go, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. So that's the reason to do it. Um, the economic impact here is going to be huge. We're going to add uh, seven new employees, uh, in, actually within months now. <laughs> it's kind of exciting. Uh, we're also moving our offices. We're in downtown Nevada City now. We're moving to the Nevada City Tech Center, which is kind of exciting, just outside of where the Grass Valley Group building used to be. So we'll be 
adjacent to the new digital media campus, if all goes according to plan, that was just got, got its uh, feasibility grant going, so we're, we're excited about that. Um, we're going to hire between 70 to 80 contractors. At some point, in, in, uh, definitely in phase one and in future phases, we'll have five teams building simultaneously. It's going to be a massive undertaking and massive coordination. Uh, we're going to be joining the ranks of Kansas City, Austin, Chattanooga, Danville, Lafayette, and uh, you know uh, tens of scores of other small cities that are doing this. And what's amazing is we're in the first phase of this, so we are the ones that are getting a lot of attention. Eventually, this is going to become more ubiquitous, but we're going to be in the first phase. We're going to get a lot of attention, and we're really one of very few projects like this in California. There are some going on in Southern California, but we're going to be really focused on it, and because of our proximity to the Bay Area. So. The other thing that happens across the country is the value of the house goes up by 10% just out the door because you have a fiber access to it. So already, economic development just happens because you have that connection. And because of scarcity, it's probably going to go up more here. Just out the door. Sounds kind of economic. Do you got to cut that? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> I wish we were part of that. I don't think the realtors want to share. That's okay. So how would you that changes everything? So I'm going to talk a little bit about the technology and the kind of applications and things that are going to run on these systems. Remember, it's a network, and we're not just talking about the internet anymore. We're talking about having a gigabit fiber network connecting all our buildings here. They can talk to each other. They don't have to go out on the internet. There are things they can do together. We don't even know what those applications are now. But some of those they're talking about right now for when it's telemedicine. You may have heard the hospital is doing telemedicine now. And they do it because they have a pretty big pipeline going there. And they can do remote uh, care sometimes with uh, surgeons in another uh, city or state advising on a particular process that's going on. Or sometimes a psychologist can be working with somebody. Imagine being able to do that in your house. So imagine with a nurse practitioner, someone you know, is really not capable of coming to the doctor's office, and a nurse practitioner can go there with diagnostic connections to that person's internet using the large screen. We're not going to call it a TV anymore. It's the large screen. Just know that. Started just talking about the large screen. Because TV is going away, and I'll talk about that in a second. But that large screen will be, uh, offer us the ability to communicate with people. Imagine having a road association meeting Oh, it's a thunderstorm where it's snowing and we can't have it. And everybody's image is up there and you're all talking to each other. Or it's set up in a way where it looks like it's real, where people's heads are on, you know, you know um, kind of robot bodies and the thing. And you can actually be in your living room and having these events going on. Uh, the other thing we've talked about, uh, uh, long distance uh, learning. Uh, Stephanie Ortiz is really excited about getting Sierra College classes out to more people and also for students here to take the classes they can't take from Rockland remotely because it's ridiculously uh, hard to connect for many people on the internet. And uh, anyone who's done any uh, Rockland classes online, unless you have Com uh, Comcast cable, it's really kind of a ridiculous endeavor to do it. But imagine more interactivity with that. We'll be working with the college to help with that. Uh, I know that uh, one thing that's happening in Kansas City is I met a woman who's developed an application for long-distance musical collaboration in real time over gigabit networks. Imagine musicians here in Kansas City and Austin doing a concert together. No latency, terrific connections. We're going to have three city concerts. I already see that happening. Kind of cool. So applications on the large screen. And then the other thing that's being talked about a lot is the Internet of Things. How many of you have heard the Internet of Things? That word, you know, maybe you haven't heard of the Internet of Things. And the Internet of Things just means that we have this network, and things can start talking to each other and talking to networks and talking to things. And today, I happen to have Michael Anderson here, who's going to be Spiral's uh, CIO, and he went to the Internet of Things conference in San Francisco just last week, right? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, there was one last year that was really small, and I guess it got really bigger this year, and Michael's going to come up and talk a little bit about what is this whole Internet of Things, and why does a gigabit network work so well with the Internet of Things? I, well, maybe I have something else for I do have something else for Hang on, sorry. Cording is making a lot of money off of this, <laughs> because cording fiber optic cable is everywhere. But they put a video out about, it's been about three years now, but I think it still uh, talks about the future. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to play it. It's a very short video, but it's a day in the life, a day in the life with glass. Sorry about that. Oh, oh, oh.
on YouTube? Yeah, 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 just, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a second one about education, which is really good, which I'm not going to show, but you can find that as well. Um, one thing that I realized in the near future is we're going to be dressing a lot better. I just want to let you know that. <laughs> <laughs> really, please have your pearls on at 7.30 a.m. in the morning. So, so I'm going to bring up uh, Michael Anderson now to talk about the Internet of Things. Uh, so I went to the Internet of Things, the first conference. It's actually a UK company that um, sponsors this, and they came to uh, the United States, Palo Alto, in 2014, and they had a small um, courtyard at a, a hotel on El Camino Real in Palo Alto, and it was just a handful of people. And uh, so I went down there this year, and they had moved it to the Moscone Center, and it was <laughs> ten times as big as last year. Um, the stuff that you saw there from the, in that porning video, that is all existing technology. It just hasn't been rolled out yet, but it's coming very soon. So this is not science fiction. This exists right now. That's real stuff that you're seeing. Um, the Internet of Things conference, walking in there is, is just um, the, the energy and the buzz, what's happening. The, the, we're right at the crutch of an exponential change in technology right now. We're right here. We're going to be going and doing things in the next 10 years that are going to blow your mind. Um, so uh, how many people have seen the movie The Minority Report with Tom Cruise? Yeah. That's the kind of stuff that I saw at the Internet of Things conference. Okay? Drones, sensors, um, just like any technology, you know, there's a good side and a bad side. So. You have to walk, look at this stuff and say, okay, maybe, there, maybe there's a problem with security, maybe there's a problem with privacy. These are things that, yeah, people are going to have to solve and, and deal with those issues. But at the same time, these technologies, first of all, they're not going to stop. It's not debatable. There aren't going to be any votes as whether this is going to happen or not. It's happening now, and it's going to continue to happen. And it's going to, again, grow exponentially. Um, what appears to be the case, however, with all of, the, all of this new technology, is that um, it's actually going to make the world a much better place um, in terms of education, wealth, quality of living. This is around the world. We've got three or four billion people that are not yet online. They're going to be online in the next 10 years. And those people are going to get educated, and then they're going to bring their wealth of ideas into uh, our world through the internet, and that's going to be a huge um, benefit to the world. Um, so problems like not enough energy, not enough water, not enough food, these things are going to get solved. We're going to have, in my opinion, the internet of things and the network, the internet, are going to solve a lot of the world's problems <coughs> in the next several decades. Um, <clears throat> so going back to what Spiral is doing, the way that the Internet of Things, and, and what that means is, is that um, pretty much everything that's in your house, everything that, that you have, anything physical, is going to be connected to the Internet, and it's going to have an intelligence. So it's going to be making decisions about how much energy to use, how much water to use, how um, just tell it, it's going to be making decisions that are, improve, are going to improve your quality of life. And a lot of this is going to be based on data that is stored remotely in the cloud. Um, things about you or your business are going to go up there and they'll be processed and then sent back down. One great example of this, John mentioned telemedicine. Um, right now, we have the human genome, which has been mapped. All right. Eventually, uh, everybody's personal genome will be known. And you'll have a six gigabit six um, gigabyte file that will be a transitioning um, as you as you age your the details in your genome change as well so that file will be transported around the internet to various uh, health providers to help you with with health decisions and that'll be key to predicting you know diseases that you might have as you get older um, and we can't do that kind of stuff with the existing internet so this is a transformative technology, the, uh, the fiber optic networks. Um, any communities that are not doing this are going to get left in the dust. This is like the railroads of the 1870s, 1880s. 
Um, in Nevada County, we had a railroad that narrow gauge that transformed this community, it got the gold out of here down to San Francisco. This is going to do the same thing. And um, right now, as John mentioned, um, we've been to some conferences to, to talk about uh, and meet other communities uh, who are doing fiber optic networks. And what's really interesting is um, they're all doing it in different ways, but the common theme is that once that gigabit network is, is um, up and running in that community, the uh, economic transformation is astounding. We went to Kansas City in January, and um, I didn't know what to expect, but once we got there, it was astounding. There are cranes you know, on the skyline, the, the city is being completely transformed, there's a new streetcar line, arts are coming in. We met all kinds of millennials who are moving there from the coasts because they can't buy a house and they can't raise a family and the quality of life there is not acceptable and they were there, they moved to Kansas City because they could now work in a, a digital, um, in a digital uh, business. A lot of them were programmers, coders, um, entrepreneurs and we, we took a bus tour on one of the days we went to all these buildings that had been gutted and turned into um, incubators, you know, six story buildings and they were just filled with millennials just coating their brains out. The walls and the surfaces were all um, with uh, dry erase and they're just writing on the tables and the walls and the, and, the, and the chairs and what have you. So very exciting. And uh, anyways, so that's the internet. If you have some questions about Internet of Things. Um, yeah, we'll be right. Yeah. Right. So. Okay, thank you. you go. I'm just going to wrap this thing. Like, I'm just going to wrap this up. I'm talking a little bit about how we can get that gigabit to you. So first, we'll be building a network under, underground along the street. So this, those are called the laterals, and they're going to be built everywhere in our project area. Uh, second, we'll be reaching from the road to your house. We'll be laying, trenching and laying in conduit and inserting fiber optic cable all the way to the house. Third is we'll bring the cable into your home nearest to your largest screen. Remember I talked about the big screen? It's not TV, it's a big screen. And connecting... Uh, the rest of the network can be connected. You can have fiber, Ethernet, or also well, uh, the, the equipment we're bringing in will have a very robust uh, commercial grade wireless network that will be produced in your house to so be able to transfer a lot of data wirelessly in the house. Mm -hmm. uh, fourth, you can use a modem Wi Fi network or you can install a wired network. And that'll be up to you what you want to do at your home or business. So, first of all, you'll be able to get rid of your landline because your cell phone will actually work in the house because. Currently, for instance, the iPhone uh, on T-Mobile and Sprint up so far, but they say AT&T and Verizon are coming along, will transfer off to the Wi-Fi network. You can make calls directly through that. You'll be having a crystal clear phone call because you're on a gigabit symmetrical network. You won't have it scrambled anymore. So the landline can go away. No more landlines, no more power. TV, we've been noodling with the idea of TV for five years now, and we think Apple TV is about to get it. Apple TV is going to, Apple's going to now, uh, reportedly is going to announce something at the, uh, their developers conference on uh, June 8th. They're talking about uh, $30 per month for all kind of channels plus local channels and things and then you can buy HBO and some of the special stuff one off. will really change how we watch TV. And the gigabit network, it won't matter. You own the cable company, you can do it through Apple. You can use Roku. There's a lot of things out there. We think Apple's going to nail it. So we had our launch event in October. How many people were at our launch event? Anybody here went to that? That was kind of cool. Uh, it was exciting to pre-announce. It was a little earlier than we maybe should have, but I, you know, I had some good speakers. Uh, and we had a video created for it by David Nicholson, who also worked on the last video. And it called, it's called It Starts With Light. It's only a minute long. Uh, and you'll get to see how we see our vision here in the back.
I know it's up here. <laughs> site and sign up and map yourself. Uh, it's very easy to do that. Um, we're about six weeks out of getting funded, and when that happens, we're going to start uh, moving wickety split. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when we're going to hit the ground. At our Nevada County Connector.com website, we'll have progress of all the uh, uh, construction and what roads, and you know, be a lot of information going out. We're going to be having a lot of community meetings in the project areas initially, and uh, I, I am. I am so excited to finally be able to launch this, uh, and we'll be moving to the tech center probably I'd say right after the first of the year in our new offices. It's where our network operations center will be, and um, we're going to Nevada County is going to change, and Nevada County online and what you do is going to change, and part of that is start to look at how you might be able to use this kind of network because. This network is also an intranet, which means talking amongst ourselves, we have fiber to do that. Imagine what you could do on that. Because it's like using, you know, there's no cost to do that. Because it's internally. So how do you use that? You know, these are things to start thinking about. Where is our future life? So uh, we're open for questions unless you want yeah. to wrap it up. Yeah, let's do some question and answers. Um, I have just a couple. Quick questions. One, what was the 95959 Google? What's the significance of that number? I hope I'm not being redundant. That's a zip code. Thank you. No, that's not that city. I come from uh, Roseville. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 so, yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, it's a zip code over that city. So we just call it that. And of course, you know, Bass Valley and everybody else got offended. But the idea was to bring it to Nevada County, and we needed to put a city name on that. And that's where the answer My primary question was, in, way back, uh, AT and T and landlines and and um, and dial-up network was available, right? Yeah. AT and T at, at one point it was five or six or or dial-up no. essentially. No, it was never. No, but then they went. Then the AT and T came out with copper, but you can get DSL. I mean, you have a really reverse. So, so fiber optic yeah. networks were around what, 20 years now, 25 years. I mean, they've been, they've been longer than that. They've been hooking up the bigger pipelines with fiber. It was very expensive at one point. And the, always the last mile, so from the central office to the house has been copper uh, for a long time, actually, even you know, before that. And then that copper was never replaced. So the, the reason, and AT has no plans to do that. The, the phone companies, Verizon, which is the other big wireline telephone company, as AT and T, you know, which used to be SBC Global. I mean, that you know, all came back together. Verizon is completely getting out of the wireline business. They're selling it all to Frontier, 
they're going to stay in the cellular business because they make lots of money there. They never figured out how to charge us by the gigabit on a landline. That was stupid on their part, but they didn't. They actually undercut everybody else and messed it all up or whatever. Um, and then staying with AT&T, they're getting out of the wireline business. They haven't announced how they're doing it yet, but they are bringing some fiber in. We think that the fiber that's being brought in here is going to be used for microcells for their cellular network because they have told the FCC that their solution for a faster internet in rural areas is cellular service. So, the yeah. copper is going to rot on the poles. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. well, use, Uverse, use, is, which is an AT&T product, is the using copper. the copper lines yes. yeah. to provide DSL speed, right? Yeah. Yeah, it, so, know, Uverse is a brand name. It's just a, it's a slightly different level of service. Well, it offers slightly faster service to people who are very close to the central office or very close to a remote terminal out in the field. Just remember, in the year 2000, the United States was number one in broadband for price and speed. We are now number 27 in the world. Ooh. Yeah. In 15 years, we've dropped. It's a kind of embarrassing, actually. So we need to fix that. Now, a lot of the countries that were able to, to um, bypass us, they were doing it with large government um, grant um, that become a, a monopoly, much like what happened with uh, IT&T and then AT&T 130 years ago, when they were given a monopoly, said, here's a guaranteed um, profit, but you have to provide service to everybody, and that gave us the best telephone system yeah. on the planet for 100 years. Okay, that's what South Korea, Indonesia, <clears throat> many European countries have done, but we're not going to do that here. If that horse is out of the barn, the barn doors are open, it's too late for us to do that. And plus, we're too big of a country to do that, and our, our culture is not that way. But we actually have something that they don't, which is that we have uh, an entrepreneur spirit where we can have companies like this that can do leapfrog, leapfrog technologies. So what's going to happen is you're going to have these communities mm -hmm. that are going to start bypassing the speeds that you see over there, and then we're going to catch up, and uh, there'll be a hybrid, and it'll actually be a much more robust network because it's going to be a mix and match. It's not all going to be run by one entity. And of course, you know, one entity might be able to turn it off if they want to. That won't happen here. Let's get a few more questions. Uh, who owns the cable? So uh, there, uh, we will be owning the cable. I mean, so we own my spot also. Yeah. Anybody can lease from us the cable? Anybody can lease from it. We're not, uh, so the way it's being set up, two companies are being set up, Bright Fiber Network will be a corporation that owns the fiber. Uh, at some uh, point in the future, we will, that, that company will probably lease the access on those lines for other, and they're going to lease it to Spiral for sure. And then other possible providers probably 10 years down the pipe. But there's other ways that that network's going to be used, and we don't even know what that is. So yes, it'll be open at some point. What's the maximum capacity of the game? I can't talk. I, I'm not the network engineer, but okay. well, 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 my, my understanding is the glass is capable of, of um, carrying you know up to a terabit or more. So that's the design is to be able to scale, as John said earlier, yeah. that we'll be able to go from. No, it's scalable. I just want to make sure that we have the right block. We're going to have that's correct. We're going to have a lot of Yeah, we're going yeah. to have a lot of terrific engineers. Let's get a couple more questions because I want to respect people's time. That we're um, to... Some time ago, I went online and signed up that I was interested when you guys asked for that. Is it any? Is that something that we can do? Is there anything we can do to help you get this thing going? I mean, it's good to let people know. I mean, if, if you're in a neighbor, if you're in the project area or a neighborhood, if, you know, in phase one, um, we're going to start organizing those communities. So call us and say, hey, I can help organize my street or whatever. That helps. Uh, even in the future ones, that would be a little further down the pipe, but that would help. Uh, there should be a lot of desire for people to get connected. Once once this becomes public, I, I know there's going to be a rush to, hey, what, what me, 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 me. Yeah. So we're going to be um, getting communities together to do that. Yeah. Yeah. What are the phases in terms of time? Uh, we're going to, so phase one, it, one week when the money comes in, two year construction. Two years, okay. And then each one, we're, they're going to overlap those. We know. I mean, we'll, we'll have a better sense of once we get, you know, we haven't done any of the, the plans for construction yet. We'll have that once I can bring people on staff to do it. Yeah, we have the, the larger um, network diagram of the, the major loops. Yeah, but we already have that done. Yeah. That's all done. But what we don't have is, you know, into the each each neighborhood what, what's going to happen there. And that, again, will be determined a lot by the neighbors because there's easements that have to be built with yeah, all kinds mm -hmm. of things. You know? Side net neutrality, you know, it drives you more toward being just a utility. We are, but there is competition with this. Yeah, well, well, I mean, FCC has declared that neutrality is a yeah. I mean, we, we were going to do that out the door. I mean, we're not going to throttle anyone uh, 
content provider. No, no, but, yeah. no but that, it, it shifts the internet to be more of a utility industry. Oh, I'm sorry, it does, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. And we understand that, we're coming in yeah. as a utility. Yeah. We know there will be applications developed on top of it, we may develop some of those, we don't even know yet, but building the network is key, and we know it's a utility service. Yet you'll have competition with the cellular. You'll be competed with, uh, at and is going to compete with you by our They will. Yeah, how do I book up? <laughs> They have done to me for the past ten years. <laughs> Comcast is already dropping their prices. They, they, this is on their radar. They're totally freaked out. Comcast is completely freaked out that we're coming here, even though we're not going into their area. It's kind of fun. But they don't get their rent. <laughs> don't tell them. They, 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 they challenged us to rent. They, 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 they were total jerks with the PUC. Yeah. I'm on Comcast. I want, I want you to drive their prices. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So what will happen is the prices will go down because they don't know where we're at. And so we're going to encourage people in Comcast areas to call up Comcast and go, you know, thinking of switching the spiral, can you give me a better price? And we're going to put that word out. And then we can watch the prices drop to see where they drop to, which will help us out as we move into those areas. Can we start this question? Two questions. Four twenty-six is number one. Uh, oh, uh, South Korea. Ah, okay. And also, did you get a I mean, our video, the Mad County video was awesome. Did you see the video of the winners? I was curious what that was like. The Google winners. The Google did it. Yeah, the Google Kansas City didn't do a video, but Kansas City actually had their act together. I mean, they came in, and, you know, I mean, they did. They said, we're going to give you a full access. I mean, we met, we met with the vice mayor. Or, uh, yeah. It's really interesting, the two communities, because what actually happened was yeah. the, the Kansas City, Missouri, and Kansas City, Kansas put in separate applications, and Google was like, what's that? <laughs> You know, and they didn't. Have, they hadn't talked to each other, so they didn't find out until late, later on in the process that they had both done done this. And then Google said, "We're really looking very strongly at what you're doing here, but we won't, you're going to have to work together." So they actually had to put together a joint powers agreement in order to be able to use the same utility um, rules and yeah, yeah, yeah. equipment and what have you. And now, uh, because of Google, the two communities, which have been kind of at loggerheads for decades, if not a century or more. Are now working together very well, and uh, they get along in there. Yeah, we, it was funny because they talked about that a lot because they they have historically been um, you know not enemies, but it's a, it's a funny place. And they're not divided by a river; they're divided by a road called State Line Road, State literally line road. a two lane road. One side is Missouri, and one side. So it's funny, yeah. There's just, there's just a tiny little road. They're in the house on both sides, and totally bizarre. You know, you walk across the street, and you're in another state. But they're cool. They want to work with us. Anything else? Let's uh, give a big round of applause. Oh, One more here, real quick, just a camera moment. Dorian, hit it. Can't take too many. All righty, we're good. All right, guys, so we don't have to be out here immediately, uh, but we just couldn't. Wait till next month. 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 Wait till next.